Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Again, I'm your host, Phil Dark, and I am so glad that you uh, have downloaded. You've taken the time to download this show, and I'm really, really glad you did. Today, as usual, we have a guest with us who's going to share so much wisdom, so many great things with us that I just can't wait for you to hear. Quite frankly, I can't wait to get these uh, get this conversation going because I know I've had a little conversation with our guest, and it was it was great, and I learned a ton from that, and I have no doubt we are in for a treat today. So, um, but before we get to Max Rook, who is our guest, we are going to, I just want to remind you about the Facebook group that we have. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and join the Facebook group. Um, and there we are able to, you know, you can share guests that you'd want us to have on the show. You can share with us any comments, thoughts that you have, you know, this isn't about just you listening. I mean, yeah, that's part of it. You listening and learning, but really we want to engage the conversation, get to know each other better, be able to help each other. Um, and we can only do, uh, from our side, what we can do, but if you join in, it makes it much, much better and stronger. So hopefully you'll be able to do that. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and subscribe to the show. And uh, you can just do that wherever you're listening. So without more about that, we're going to get to this interview with Max Rook. Max is the associate head coach at Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. So that's uh, something to be envious about for you folks out there. If, you, if you're if you not <laughs> already envious about him being an associate head coach. But he also is uh, the founder of Life to the Max, which we're going to learn a little bit about that later on today, too. So, Max, how you doing, man? Great, my man. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, just this is this is I'm excited. And I uh, I just loved our first conversation that we had. And so I'm excited to, to have another another great one today. Fantastic. I think I've said Max more times now in this interview already. Have <laughs> all the interviews combined. So that's fantastic. Um, all right. So, you know, if people are familiar with Pepperdine and Pepperdine soccer, they'll know all about you. Or if they've taken one of your courses, they'll know about you as well. But um, a lot of people haven't have heard of you, don't know who you are. So can you just really just briefly share your story, how you develop your passion for soccer leadership and how you got to be where you are today? Yeah. Um, well, again, first of all, thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. I love the opportunity to, to share, sharing each other's stories. And I'm always fascinated with other people's and and my journey began, I'm Rizzy from England, um, and just like like a lot of English people or European people, I was just engrossed by the game of soccer and, and quickly took to the game of soccer. So at a young age, I, I got to play it and found myself um, being able to get connected with Reading Football Club. So I grew up, grew up in Reading, but at an early age, I was, I was on their radar, and so I got to be in their academy, and I got to do have some, some really cool things there. And and uh, got to play uh, in the youth team. And so that was just kind of a part of, of my, my beginning stages of understanding kind of this world of high performance, which, which uh, again, I'll talk about in a little bit, I'm sure we'll get to. But, but yeah, when I was like 16, 17, I'm on the youth team. And then I got to, got to play in the reserve team, I got to play a few first team games. And I'm like, man, this is, this is incredible, right? This is incredible, this whole experience about, you know, as a, as a boy, you dream of being a professional athlete, you dream of, of playing in these big stadiums in front of these, you know, amazing fans and just feeling that energy. And, and, uh, and that was a part of it. And I was on that journey and I was going, going there and again, getting to play in the first thing that was fantastic. Um, but as you know, as I'm sure, I'm sure you've had many people on the show that can, that can attest to it. It's a cutthroat world. It's a cutthroat industry, the professional game, especially in Europe. And, um, and so at the age of sort of 17, 18, they said, you know, you're probably not, probably not, equipped to make it in the game so about 18 years old, I had this this decision to make and it was continued to pursue you know the the, the road to, to professional soccer in England um, and I was I was ready to do that but then um, quickly this other this other avenue if you will just appeared and it was at the time it wasn't playing playing in america playing college soccer playing in america the idea of playing soccer in america or football right it was a, it it wasn't a big thing it wasn't something i'd heard of but um but i i had a teammate who the previous year had gone to this tryout the pfa so once you once you like once i was with reading you're a part of what they call a professional football association so you're a lifelong member so the professional football association put on this opportunity this this trial if you will and brought over these american coaches at these universities 
And they brought these players that were out of contract at these professional clubs and said, hey, you know, if it fits, here's an opportunity, here's an op- here's a new opportunity for you. So I had this, this teammate who, who went the previous year and he came back and he said, you know, hey, Boston, I think he was going to Boston. He's like, hey, the Boston, da, da, da. And so he, he went and I stayed in touch with him. I said, this sounds cool. So I stayed in touch with him and, he, and I got to hear about his experience. So the following year, when, when like I said, I got the news that, that uh, you know, that I wasn't going to get my contract renewed, it, it kind of like the two roads started to appear. And again, it was, it was the do what everybody's always done or take the road less traveled. And it was this opportunity to go to America. So I, I went to this trial and a few, a few, um, a few coaches, they, they offered me an opportunity. So anyways, long story short, I end up in Macon, Georgia, Macon, Georgia. Like, I mean, I, I wouldn't have known the difference between Malibu, California, Macon, Georgia. like I, I wouldn't know the difference. So I'm like, Macon, Georgia, this is awesome. So I go to little old Macon, Georgia, I play for a team called Merce University. We had an amazing time. We had an amazing team. Uh, we did, you know, um, if you read through it, like we had, we had a lot of success. We had a lot of great things happen, but that really at 18 years old coming over to America, literally coming on a plane with a suitcase and a dream. That was basically it. And it changed my whole life. It changed my whole perspective. It changed my whole vision of, of what I felt I wanted out of life. And then that kind of spearheaded me, um, not only from playing, uh, I got to do some cool things. I got to play in a couple of world championships, got to play for Great Britain in the World University Games and got to do all these, all these fun things. But it, that's not why we're here to talk about that. But it, it then became clear to me that, that the love of the game, the love of football, the love of soccer, it wasn't just about trying to become a professional athlete. It was more about, about helping and about serving and about, and about giving back to the game what the game gave to me. So, so after I graduated, um, I flitted around a little bit, played, played in some other places in Florida and stuff like that. But then the opportunity to coach came by and I got into coaching and it was, you know, I'm a young, I'm a young coach. And, um, and, and so I was trying to figure out, you know, how to be a coach, how to transition from being a player to being a coach. And I, uh, I got to, to work at this private Christian school and I became a PE teacher and a head boys and girls soccer coach. And then that, that's where I was introduced to coaching and it was completely different. It was completely out of my comfort zone, but it was completely amazing at the same time. And that is where I really, again, began to find this, this, this marriage of taking what I had learned as a, as a high performance athlete and as a high level athlete, both in Europe and in America, and then trying to help others achieve similar goals and similar dreams. And so, um, so that led me to them getting into college athletics. Um, I met my beautiful wife of uh, almost 13 years. She's a, she's a college um, coach as well on the volleyball. So she coaches collegiate volleyball. So then we, we got married and we shared this passion for, uh, again, for coaching. And that led us to Illinois. Um, she she um, was, a, was a college coach and she accepted a position at the University of Illinois. So at that time, we were still living in, in Georgia and I basically stopped what I was doing. And, and as you know, like family is everything. So it was like, it was never about, for us, it was never about having this, this vision of like, okay, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a head coach and I'm going to do whatever it takes. It's like, well, if she has a dream too. And so she, had, she wanted to pursue this opportunity. She said, well, what about you? I said, I'll figure it out. No problem. You know, it's, about, it's more about our relationship. And so that led me to, um, to stay in the college game. But then I also got into club coaching. I became the director of a club and that was like new for me too. So, I, so then I'm starting to work with little itty bitty, little nippers, little five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. And now, now I'm trying to evolve and understand how to teach young players. You know, I was used to teaching high school players and, and, um, and so that was another step in stone, and, but it was, it was a beautiful thing too. And, and ultimately, I guess, long, long, long story short, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a part in that time where we went from Georgia to Illinois, where um, I met this guy named Tim Ward, who is the, now he's the head coach at Pepperdine University. And he, he called me up, um, actually, have we, got, have we got two minutes? Can I tell you this story? Is that okay to tell you this story? I think it's a good story. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, if it's not good, I'll just cut so it. My, <laughs> so, so, so this this is this is what life is this is, to me this is what life is you can already tell i'm passionate right so this is that marriage of life and soccer so so my wife noel my beautiful wife noel she um grew up in california and she went to high school with tim ward who's the head coach here at Pepperdine, and um and they and my wife moved to moved to the east coast and was to florida and i said how we met but um 
she would always come back to Pepperdine. She worked these camps, these volleyball camps at Pepperdine. She worked for this this guy named Mark Dunphy, who was um, the uh, like he's like an Olympian. He's like he's just done amazing things for the for the game of volleyball. He's like the John Wooden of volleyball. Right. So she would come back and work every year. I knew nothing about about Pepperdine, and um, and so this one year she's she says, hey, she says I'm going to work a volleyball camp. But guess what? I heard that the soccer camps at Pepperdine. They're the same week. So I'm, why don't I just call up the head coach? I'll see if you can work the soccer camp. I'll work the volleyball camp. We'll turn it into a little holiday. We'll visit some family. Everything's going to be good. So I was like, okay, sure. So she calls Tim up and she says, hey, Tim. You know, and obviously they went to high school together. I said, hey, Tim, um, you know, is it possible if my husband can work your soccer camp? And, uh, you know, Tim doesn't know me. And he's like, well, what's his deal? So she said, hey, we well, used to play for a football club and da-da-da. I said, well, if he's good enough to marry you, He's good enough to work my camp, bring him out. So we come out and I work this and I get introduced to Pepper and I get introduced to Tim. And in that moment, as soon as I met Tim, we shared a similar philosophy, not just about soccer, but life, how to treat women, because it's a women's program that I'm currently at right now. Um, and we had this amazing experience. And so we left and, uh, and about six months later, uh, we had this vision, Noah and I had this vision to always move back to the West Coast, but we never knew how we were going to do it. And uh, about six months later, we're in Illinois. So I'd said at this time, we're living in Illinois, in like you know, a foot of snow, ice storm, you know, I'm like going to coach these little itty bitties, this little club game. I'm, I've got like a bag of balls and stuff like that. I'm slipping on the black ice, trying to get into this indoor facility. And then uh, Tim calls me up, you know, and he's a surfer dude. He's like, and I start to pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. He goes, what up, brother? What up, dude? What's going on, dude? He's like, just been surfing. What's going on? I'm like, hey, Tim, what's going on? Now, granted, right, this is that emergence of, like, your life's vision, um, just just everything merging together as one. And he says, hey, he says, did you know that my assistant just moved on to take a head coaching position somewhere else? I said, yeah. And he said, but you didn't apply for the job. I said, I know. He said, well, why not? I said, I don't know. At the time, I was probably the least qualified person for the job to be where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. um, but he said, Max, he said there was something about uh, that week that we had together. There was something about what we talked about. There was something about you. There was something about the energy. There was something about what I felt we could do together. He's like, you're the man for the job. Do you want to take it? And I'm like, goodness me. So I turned to Noel and I'm like, hey, Noel, what do you think? And same thing as when I when I step down from my position to follow Noel to Illinois. She's like, let's do it. I was like, it's about us, you know? And so she, she stepped down from her position. We moved to, to Malibu, California, where we currently reside. I work at Pepperdine University, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I get to work with some amazing, amazing elite athletes. I get to work, work with extraordinary people and I get to coach and serve and do what I love. And so right now, like I say, um, what I'm doing is such a blessing and, um, and it was, and it was all because of that moment. And so, um, anyways, I probably won't take up a lot of time, but it's just, it's, it's crazy how life works. And, uh, and I just, yeah, I'm so blessed to be here. And obviously like I say, now that led us to this conversation. Absolutely. No, it's fantastic. I, I love that. I love the story. I always talk about the fact, one of my favorite parts of all this is the stories and, and I, and it's in, it's not ever, it was like, well, why do you spend so much time on story? Well, because the story is so critical to hear that. I mean, all of that will then lend itself to the rest of the conversation it lends itself to all the things other things you're going to be saying for that credibility but sure. also from your life story I mean, even even with your relationship with tim right just hearing that where you had that you know for that week together right i mean mm -hmm. the fact that he saw something right and now you know i think on the other end of it we've talked a little bit about this already i'd love to get into a little bit more about that with you and tim and as you've learned about each other, as you've taught, as you've uh, coached together, you know, we talked a little bit about before about personalities in the show. We've talked about personalities on the disc, uh, you know, certified disc instructor, as well as just, you know, love studying personalities and in coaching similar to you and Tim, my head co or my head coach in the in the high school soccer that I, I coach with is opposite personality to me. And that lends itself to some really cool things. And so can you just share that about you and Tim? I mean, even what we talked about before um, this, this interview yeah. before recording. Yeah. 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 So like I said, so I've been, I've been at Pepperdine now for 
for seven years now, going into our eighth season uh, right here. Um, because of COVID, obviously, we, we, we didn't have a full, a full season. So we're about to, you know, hopefully have here have a spring season. So, yeah, so we're going into my eighth season. And we've had some really great success together. Tim's been here for 27 of the 28 years that the program's been in existence, wow. both as an assistant and as a head coach. Like, And so, you know, he is Pepperdine soccer. And um, <clears throat> and so and so what, what really stuck out is when we, again, go back to kind of that moment that we shared it we, we shared that similar philosophy on on life on again like like the women's game is very different to the men's game you know and so you have to be a special type of coach to be able to coach women versus men I think there are a lot of similarities but but also there are some differences and so Tim is amazing at that so so once I realized it kind of is almost like I'm like there's somebody else that values the same things that I do I left that week with that, that camp and I'm like there's somebody who values the same things that I do however as we talked about um your day-to-day your daily habits and how your processes and stuff they can be different and so and so what really works well with our staff um so Ari is the other staff member who works um as well and she brings she blends Tim and I together really well and she brings this female perspective that just you know brings this wholeness to our to our staff but Tim and I um Tim's so creative he's so creative and as a head coach his job is to constantly be pushing the envelope you know you look back at some of um I, I taught a class here at Pepperdine last semester and and it was on the foundations of coaching. And one of the, the case studies that we did was on Alex Ferguson. And Alex Ferguson, somebody who's been at Man United for such a long time. And they, one of the things that we studied that Harvard Business did, they studied and they talked about how he was always on the cutting edge. Like there were certain things that he like, you knew about Alex Ferguson, knew about his teams, but on, at the same time, he was always on the, on the edge, on the cutting edge. He was always, he was always evolving and he was always creating. He wasn't, he was willing to, to take risks, you know? And so that's Tim. Tim is somebody who is also, he's always creating. But creation, if it's not partnered with application, can sometimes get lost. And so I think we, we've found our success with our program is, is Tim is very creative and will come up with amazing ideas, things to keep us evolving as a team, and whether it's tactically, physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever it's going to be. Um, and then I'm the, I'm the, it guy like I can make it happen so I'm like hey Tim you know of his 20 ideas I'm like Tim give me the top three you know right. <laughs> like boil it down give me your top three and I will make them happen for you you know what I'm saying so right. um yep. so but without without Tim's creativity I don't have that I don't I don't have that but without me and Ari Tim's creativity could get lost in the weeds so it's 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 great I think you know uh, we could probably talk about this all day but when you get into like leadership one of the things that makes him great is he lets us as, as his assistants and associate coach, he lets us do our thing. He lets us bring our, our best. You know, we are always are operating, operating in our strength zones. And when you bring everybody's strengths together, um, that's what can get stuff done. And, uh, and he's a great leader in regards to that. He knows what we're good at and, um, and we blend it all together. So yeah, and we've had, you know, we've had some great success. We've been to some sweet 16s, we won a couple of WCC championships in the last few years. And um, you know, and that's, that's not what we, evaluate our program on but um i think that's more of an external thing people look at from the outside in and man, like man you're pretty successful and you find yourself in the ranked in the top 10 or the top 15 and, but that's not how we evaluate our program our, our program runs way deeper than that which i'm yeah. sure we'll get into but um but yeah tim tim and i are amazing i'm so blessed to work with them. yeah we'll definitely get into that more as far as you know you pepperdine how you're doing it there um but i will tell you that uh i totally love what you're talking about there it's i talk about it all the time as i'm training up organizations talking to different leaders um if you're just surrounding yourself with people like you you're not going to be successful in an organization in a team you're just you're not going to you're going to be missing you're going to have so many blind spots but as you talked about it and i'm i'm more like tim i'm wired like tim i i imagine i mean uh, I grew up in Southern California, but I'm not really a surfer boy. But I, I you know, I mean, I, when you said you were opposite from the surfer boy, Tim, people were probably just thinking you're the stuffy British guy. But, you know, I won't get into that part. Um, but uh, no, but I think that that I love the what you talked about where he allows you to he frees you up to be working your strengths. And that's not only great leadership but for him i mean that's really the only way it's going to work because he also is self-aware it sounds like he's very self-aware sure. he knows sure. the execution is not necessarily his strength it doesn't make mm -hmm. him a bad leader it doesn't make him a bad person it makes him knowing who he is and he's very self-aware i was talking with somebody else about yeah. this today too um 
you know, in my organization, my COO is very task focused and he's a guy who executes extremely well to the point where he doesn't say, give me your top three. He's like, Phil, stop talking about 55,000 things. You know, let's go. We got to focus. We got to focus. And, uh, you know, because mission drift is a real thing, right? You know, and so if you keep sure, going sure. for the shiny object and the squirrels, you're going to be constantly going all over the place. So to have that, team, to have that balance is absolutely critical. And so, you know, with that, you know, we talk about that collaboration. So you have the collaboration at the level of, of coaching staff, right? As you talked about, you have you and Tim and then your, your other assistant who's able to kind of gel it together, which is fantastic. Um, but also the game of soccer teaches us a lot about collaboration, right? You know, and, and, you know, so what can we take from that? What can we take from the, first of all, how does it teach about that? Right. And then what can we take that to yeah. outside the pitch? Yeah, that, oh man, it's a, such a loaded question. I, I, I think that what I, oh, over the years, I think what I've really come to understand that I love about not just, not just soccer, but I think team sports in general, when you talk about collaboration is that, um, it allows us to do something that we typically wouldn't be able to do by ourselves, mm. you know? And when, when you, th and I've been victim of this, by the way, he's like, ah, I do it all myself. You know, it's like, and we just can't, we just can't like there's, there's, so whether it's on the soccer field or whether it's, whether it's in life and business, whatever it's going to be like the ability to, to think bigger, broader, more expansive, to, to, to believe in, in something bigger and better comes when you understand that when you're pulling on the resources of everybody, then it allows you to think about things that you wouldn't normally be able to achieve by yourself. And so, you know, I look at it like, like the responsibility of us as coaches, I think as a coach, and this might be slightly getting off topic, but I think a, a, the responsibility, and I've heard Tim say this many times to our team is the, the responsibility of us as coaches is to take our players places that they wouldn't be willing to go by themselves, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so when you bring it back to this idea of collaboration, I think when you collaborate with people, it allows you to go places you wouldn't normally be able to go by yourself. Yep. Um, and so whether that's vision, with, again, whether it's application, whatever it's going to be, but, but that, that's truly what I love about being part of a team, whether that's been as a player, as a coach. And uh, when I was a high school coach, I was a head coach. I've been a head coach. I've been an assistant coach. I'm an associate head coach. I've been at, at you know, youth sports, high school level, uh, college level whatever it's going to be i just think that it really is something special about when you unite with people and you're all facing the same way looking towards the same goal the same vision or the same mission as you said um there's something really special in that you know and uh and something uh that that uh, aside from the soccer is that i do is i'm i'm i have a, another program um or another business called life to the max. And it's, and it's a lot of it is about, you know, high performance coaching and, but mindset, a lot of mindset. And, and I say, this is like where focus goes, energy flows, you know, you know, what you put your, what you put your attention on, what you put your focus on, um, you're going to get more of, you know, whether that's good, bad, positive, negative, the problem, the solution, you know, and when you're working in collaboration with people, and you're focused on the right things. I just, I just, I've seen it over and over again, really special things can happen. And I just think that when we work in isolation, sometimes we get so fixated on ourselves, you know, and well, without getting too deep into it, but when, but when you, when you are in isolation and you're, and you're, and you're so focused on the self, um, you can't serve, you can't serve. And, and you notice there's a higher vibration when you get out of yourself and you get into others and you start to connect and collaborate you start operating at a different energy level and that energy level allows you to achieve amazing things, not just, not just, you know, personally, but, but collaboratively too. So, so yeah, I just think I, I hopefully that makes sense, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a special thing. And I, I, that, that is ultimately, I was, guess what I would say is this, that is what has continued to fuel me over these years, both as a player and as a coach. It's like, that's why I haven't gotten out of the game is because, it's almost like I'm addicted to being a part of a team because 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 of what it can do for you and and how you get to be responsible for for other people and and a part of people's dreams and a part of people's successes and it's just it's awesome you know and so anyway to get me started now 
Phil. I'm getting. I'm off on a. I'm going. <laughs> but you're almost, you're almost starting to preach here, but you know, you you, you had to drink a drink of water, so it kind of saved it from that. But no, I, I I I look at that and I go, that's such a a great picture of as you you know you talked about you can go you go to places you never would have gone you know the synergies that happen in a great collaboration are something that a lot of people never experience because they never take that gamble because it is a gamble to go in all in together on a team you know and yeah people are coming to pepperdine because they want to come to pepperdine and play for a great program they want to go to malibu there's probably all these different reasons for it right but they get there and you talk about you got to get on the same page, mission, vision, values. That's going to come from the top. Typically, it's going to come from the coaches. Sure. Coaches are going to get buy-in, however coaches get buy-in, hopefully. And then, but the thing is, you got to agree on where you're going, right? And, and if the, if everyone on that bus doesn't, doesn't really want to go there, they're going to make it miserable for the rest of them. So how are you able so, to be able to do I mean, just anybody who's been on a road trip with their family, you're going to have a lot of miserableness yeah. going on if you're not yeah. all wanting to go, first of all. But also... Yeah. You know, you got to know how to, you know, make people happy <laughs> and joyful, yeah. how to get them to yeah. choose joy on their own and not make them. You can't yeah. make someone joyful. Right. So how yeah. do you do that? And how can you make someone be the best they can be? And that's really where you look at that collaboration in a team. Yeah. And you talked about that. It's, it's almost like a it's almost like a drug of team. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, you've seen my big, my big. Yeah, a, a big and a, I was going to say a big. What what comes to mind as you're saying that too is is the the art of of team. You know, the art of coaching a team or leading a team is the ability to get everybody to set their own gender agenda aside. You know, is like as an individual when you come into that, like yeah, you're like oh, I can part of a team, but but generally we all it's, it's inherent in everybody. We're humans, right? We, we take care of number one, so it's like when you when you unlock the door and you open yourself up to kind of set your own gen agenda aside and just live into the team's agenda or the team's vision and mission, like you said, uh, that is not an easy thing to do. But when you can, when you can tap into that, that really is just, you know, that's why so many of those teams are so successful, all different levels. It's, it's the, like, even, even some of the, you know, like some of the top teams, like the Phil Jacksons and some of the, some, you know, again, going back to that, when I taught this class, we got into that sort of thing is, is how do you, how do you get somebody who is making millions and millions of dollars or pounds or whatever it's going to be, and you get them to lay their body on the line or to, to, to kind of go the extra little, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's an art, that's an art form to be able to get somebody to set their own agenda aside, you know, and the dollars and the advertising and the, you know, and all that. So, and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a special, special thing. And, and when you do that, like I say, it's, it's, it's untapped potential is what it is. It's untapped potential. Absolutely. So, and you see underperforming too happen a lot of times when they're not content, mm -hmm. when you're not getting that, when you don't have that. And I think all you need to do is look at Paul Pogba over the last few years and you'll see a guy who yeah, has underperformed sure. the last few games. He's looked amazing. You saw him smile. You saw him. I mean, I don't know if yeah. he had games this week, but he, yep. he's yep. smiling. I haven't seen that right. in Paul Pogba in years, right? Part yep. of it's the winning part of it. You know, there's a lot to it, but point being, he's now on that bus willingly. Mm -hmm versus yeah, absolutely. being dragged onto it because of whatever, you know, I can't even imagine totally. Manchester United having that playing, but yeah. it is what it is. Right. But that's, it goes to it at the highest levels, but also, you know, you go to the lowest levels and you see kids that their parents are dragging them there and they're miserable yeah. and that's not healthy for anybody either. Right. And so sure. you look at this and you go, okay, what is, what does that look like? So with that, I want to, I want to move on to the next thing. I think there's some, I mean, Obviously, with all these issues, we could talk for days about them, um, particularly with your program and what we're talking about. But I just want to talk, speaking of your program, and you alluded to this in, in uh, the last answer, but really at Pepperdine, you've over the last you know several years, and I don't know exactly when it happened, but you, you, we talked earlier about a, um, in, our, in our previous conversation about a shift in focus at Pepperdine, yeah. really, and yeah. how, what you've learned from it how that's impacted your program, but also I want you to talk a little bit about what that shift is, how it's the impact it's had, and then how, what we can learn from that again, outside of, outside the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I get really, I get really excited every time I get to, to talk about, about, about this. I think, you know, we, we, we talked about it before. Um, 
in the world of I, I consider consider myself and what we do here at Pepperdine, um, you know, being in the world of high performance, right? We're one of, we're one of the top teams in 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 uh, NCAA Division One women's college soccer, and there is an expectation, you know, it's like everybody comes in, like you say, there are players that come in and they come in knowing they're going to get to play for one of the top programs in the country against other top programs in the country. And, and so there is, there's is expectation that comes with that, just like, just like, just like so many other teams. And, um, and also along with that, there is this expectation of, of winning. Right. And I think that so much of the, the storyline of high performance is it's driven by results, I guess is what I'm, what I'm getting at. A lot of it's driven by results. And, and so as a program, um, naturally we kind of, that that's kind of what we're, what we're evaluated on, you know, our jobs are evaluated on our team is evaluated on, you know, on that, on how successful we are, like how many results do we get on the field? How many wins do we get? How far do we go in the NCAA? Do we win our conference championship? But but there was again, so that so there was this this time. Tim and I working together, and again, Tim's been Tim took this program from basically nothing into the powerhouse that it is today, and that was a long process over a number of years. But but if you imagine, like when you're growing, then all of a sudden you start to kind of like you know there's this there's this point where you start to kind of tip out, and then something has to change, right? Before you so you can hit the next level, and then you start to maybe you make this this growth, and then all of a sudden you start to curve out. And something has to change to hit that next level. And so we got to a place where we were succeeding, we were doing well, but there was like there was a, there was another level that we were searching for. And so we kind of, as a staff, we were like trying to evaluate what can we do to get to that next level. And so again, as as having kind of um, that that psych background and some of that mental skills, is we started to delve into kind of the mindset and the conditioning of our program. And again, we've been conditioned to believe that that winning is most important. And so we started to evaluate that. And if, and if, I, if, if I'm sure, is everybody, my boy's probably looking at this right on the screen, whatever. So uh, we have a this. audio too. So you don't want to describe okay, it. Okay. I've audio too. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. So, so I always say this, like, if you imagine, you know, whatever, and this is just, this is for a, a program. This can be for your life too. Uh, when I, when I work with individual athletes, uh, you know, and, and I, and I talk them through this, it's like, whatever we put at the very top of our, of our, pyramid if you will imagine that your pyramid was like you know or the program was like it was like a triangle kind of like john wooden's pyramid of success right whatever you put at the very top that's what you deem as most important right and what happens is that kind of filters down whatever you whatever you prioritize it kind of filters down and it affects every decision you make within your program or within your life so if winning is what's most important it's going to affect the decisions you make on game day it's going to affect uh, how you treat your players it's going to affect how you recruit. It's going to affect everything, you know? And so what we were saying was, is there another way to pursue something like success, but do it in a way which is just different, maybe more fulfilling. And so we came up with this, this concept that, you know, what if we were to take the value of winning and just not say it's not important because again, like the external world, we're, we're evaluating it, but what if we, what if we lessen that and, what if it was helping? What if winning championships? What if going far in the NCAA? What if it was actually a byproduct of something else that we were searching for? So we really searched and we delved deep and we came to this conclusion that it was like our program really is about developing women of character. Like in, in its essence, in its truest form, like we have these beautiful, strong, powerful women that come into our program and are seeking to live an amazing life. And they want to use soccer as a vehicle to do it. So we're like, that's really what we're trying. We're in the business of developing women of character. So that became like our ultimate goal. And we attached a mission statement to it and do all these things, which I don't want to bore you with. But, but that really became the vision that we were pursuing. So every single day when we step on the field or we step up, we're at practice or we're in games, like that is really the vision that we're trying to live into every day is how do we help every player in our program and our team develop into the very people that they're meant to become. So the thing about that is, again, if that becomes a priority, then that's going to filter down in your program and it's going to affect how you treat your players. It's going to affect how you recruit. It's going to affect the decisions you make. And I could tell you so many stories about how just shifting from winning to develop, developing women of character, how it's changed our process, how we have such a closer relationship with our team. But here's the funny thing, Phil, is that, as I, I mentioned this before, when we made that shift, 
we've been as successful, if not more successful than we've ever been. When we focus less on winning, we've won more than we've ever won. You know, like there was a point in time when this happened, we, we won a championship and the program had never won back-to-back championships. So it was kind of this, this thing is that we wanted to be, we want to make school history. We want to be that first team to win back-to-back championships. It had been done before. Uh, they'd won championships before, but never back-to-back. And so that year, that was right before we kind of made this shift. And so what happened, we won that, we won that first championship after, after making this mindset shift as a program. I mean, and it was like, awesome. And so going into that second season, again, expectation, pressure, you know? And we said, no, what's our ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal is to develop women of character. Things don't change. Let's, let's, let's invest in that. Let's invest in our players. Let's invest in developing women of character. And sure enough, we, uh, we, we, made, we made school history and we won back to that championships. And we've gone on. And so that, I only say that not to impress you, but also to just impress upon you, like, how important that that singular shift of focus it, again it kind of opened up we talked about the collaboration piece it opened up our minds to what's possible if we just focus on what's truly important and then anything else takes care of itself and so that has been a massive massive shift for us that uh, you know it's it's become everything that we do within our program everything that we achieve is is a byproduct of something a higher purpose a higher belief a higher a higher energy system that we're working towards. And so we're, we're always in process. We're always working towards something bigger. There's always something greater that we're searching for. And it, and it gives us the fuel and energy to, to do the things that we do. And then also, um, last thing, sorry, is, is, that, is that you're never truly defined because um, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, she says, if you're somebody when you win, what, is that, what does that make you when you lose? You know what I'm saying? If you win, all of a sudden you're amazing. If you lose, that was you terrible. No, it's like when you're in process, when you're not defined by wins and losses, when you're defined by something bigger, something more meaningful, then day-to-day results are never really going to prevent you from living into who you're truly meant to be and what you've truly been gifted with and what God's placed you on this, on this earth to do. And so we made that commitment and we've seen some amazing things happen, not just results-wise, but even with our team and with our players and and uh, it's it's special, and that's that's one of the reasons why I love working here at Pepperdine because of because of things like that, because of what what our program is founded on. So I love it. Um, I want to come play for you guys. So that, that <laughs> uh, I don't think I can. I think I got a few things <laughs> me right now. But um, now I you know I, I love so much about that, and I think one of the things I can just know is happening is you're developing servant leaders and when you develop servant leaders i think the reason why if you take the same set of players and you develop servant leaders in one set and you have the other set just kind of control group where you're just having them play focusing on soccer you're focusing on the x's and o's and you're just going all right we're going to go and winning is our top of the pyramid that national championships our goal the servant leaders are going to play harder for each other. They're going to love each other more. They're going to, they're, if they're down, they're going to say, I can't let my teammate down. I can't, I got, you know, I gotta, I'm going to be doing it for them. I'm going to be doing it not for that win, but I'm doing it for my, for my neighbor, so to speak. I'm doing it for my teammate. I'm sure. doing it for my partner here. I'm doing it for my coaches. We're doing it for each other. Right. And as coaches, you're going to love deeper. You're going to love stronger. And, and, it goes to organizations too. You're going to get the best out of your people when you are a servant leader and you're developing servant leaders, because again, they're going to go that extra mile for you and you're going to go the extra mile for them. And they know that. And, and you can't fake that and you can't, you can't, um, it has to, it truly has to be your goal and your mission and your vision yeah. to be able yeah. to be able to do that and really do it. Yeah. And, you know, and so you're, you're still getting the same players, but you're getting more out of those same players is how I'd, I'd probably put it knowing nothing yeah. about any of the players or, um, you know, you guys, except what I've learned from you, but that's what I see um, just from what you're the mental picture I have of what you're talking about. Would you, I mean, would you say you've seen that? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I give you, I can give you an example. We had a, we had a player, um, we have a number of stories, but, but if I think about from a player standpoint, mm-hmm. And if we take that same philosophy and we bring it into like a player's a player's picture, so we have girls that want to come in, and they want to play professionally. And we had we had one year we had, a, we had a player came in and her name was Brie Vasali, and I, I've told the story many a times. And and uh, so if somebody on here has heard it before, and I'm sorry. And uh, but he's like, so I so this this girl named Brie Vasali, she comes in one day and she says um, she says, and she's a freshman, right? She comes in. This is a number of years ago, but she was a part of that that uh, two time WCC championship team, and so. 
Um, so she came in as a freshman and she's like a little itty bitty thing. And uh, she used to think she used to play for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. That was that was our club team. <laughs> like, you know, like like a nobody <laughs> team, you know, but she just like we we found her and she was just uh, yeah. like she's great. You know, so Tim Tim found her and uh, the former assistant actually because it was early on in my career. So it was Twyla. And but anyways, but she ended up at Pepperdine. And so I got to coach her. And, and one one day she came to came by and she said, hey, can I can you know, can you be my mentor? And I'm, and I'm like, well, I'm your coach. I'm, I'm already doing that. She's like, no, I know you're coaching me. She's like, but I know you do this, this mental skill stuff. You know, can you be my mentor? And I was like, sure, that's awesome. She's like, I have these big goals, big visions. And I, you know, I, I want to, I want to help you. I want you to help me get there. I said, like, sure, no problem. So I come by the office and that's the first thing, first meeting we sit down and I says, all right, I says, Bree, tell me what you want. Like, let, let me, let me understand better about what this whole journey is going to be about for you. Okay. And now, again, we're kind of shifting away from the team more to the individual, you know, and she's like, okay, she's like, well, coach, I want to be, I want to be the best player on the team. I want to be the top goal scorer on the team. I want to be the WCC player of the year. I want to be an All-American. I want to play professionally and I want to play on the U.S. national team. And I'm like, like, just that, like, that's it, you know, like, right. only that, <laughs> you can like, just that, you know, like, you're a freshman, like, that's it, you know, but she had yeah. these big goals, big, yeah. and I'm like, I love it, you know, like, inside, inside, I'm like, I love it. Um, and I would never tell anybody that, you know, you're shooting for the stuff. You know, I was like, I was like, okay, I love it. So let's, let's see if we can make it happen. So anyway, long story short, she, freshman year, she, she has these, she has these big goals and, and she does really well, by the way, like she's an all freshman performer, but she wasn't the player of the year. So it wasn't good enough. Right. You know, and you see this a lot in high performance. Okay. And this, this is just one idea about kind of that, that idea about identity. And I think, which I deal with a lot as, as, a, as, as, in the business of what I do with, with working on the mindset is dealing with people's identity, right. And how they connect their identity to results and playing time. Like I did play or I didn't play an identity. So, you know, she had this idea. She, I want to be a, I want to be a pro. I want to be a, I want to be a, you know, player of the year, but all conference wasn't good enough, you know? So she's moping around and stuff. like. We get to sophomore year. She has an amazing sophomore year. Amazing. You know, and somebody else wins the player. This sucks. Da, da, da. She's the player. Now. I'm like, Brie, come on. She's like, so, we get to like her junior year and she'd gone through this process of like just holding herself to such a high standard that she was living in this realm of like perfectionism, which, which for me, I feel is like one of the lowest common standards you can have because you can never reach perfection. So you, you're constantly in this losing battle. So finally we sat down one day um, and this is kind of where I'm going is, is I sat down, I said, Brie, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired. I'm tired of you telling me every single day what you want and making excuses of why somebody else has what you want. You know, I'm tired. I say, stop telling me what you want. Stop telling me what you want and start telling me who you need to be. Like, stop telling me what you want. Let, let, let's get, let's get real on who you need to be. Let's, let's deal with that. So we went through this process of shifting again, shifting this mindset from what to who, and we got clear on who she needed to be. And, and I, with, you know, I'm not going to tell you everything because it could take too long, but, you know, it was like things about the health, things about her training habits, things about what she was doing before practice, after practice, what she was doing socially, what she was doing spiritually, you know, connecting to a higher purpose, like we said before, um, being a servant leader, you know, stepping outside, not creating her own, my personal agenda, but making my agenda about the team. Like when you have goals like that and the coach says, put your personal agenda aside, that's hard, right? Yeah. But, but in the process of putting a personal agenda to the side, all of those goals and becoming that servant leader that you just said in a senior year by stop focusing on the what and focusing on the who in a senior, I kid you not Phil, on senior year, she was the best player on the team. <laughs> she was the top goal scorer on the team. She was the WCC conference player of the year. She was an all American right after we got done with season. She went to the, um, the, the soccer coaches convention. She got drafted. And right after she got drafted, two weeks later, the U23 US national team called her and invited her into camp. Yeah. Everything happened. Yeah. As soon as she got put her own agenda aside and just shifted this focus. And so whether it's from a team perspective or individual, it, yeah. it works. It works. But it, it's so hard for us to get out of our own way, you know. But as soon as she did, and right now she's playing for the Houston Dash, by the way, and in the, in the Challenge Cup that, that they just had. She won it and she was on the field and she started in the, in the championship game. She, and she won the, you know, so she's having a, she's having an amazing time being a professional athlete right now. And, um, 
and sure. yeah, it's a shout out to Brie. She's yeah, shout out to Brie. She's she's doing amazing things. But but that was a process that she had to go through, and it was literally she was she was in her own way, and as soon as she got out of her own way, you know, just like as our team, once we got out of our own way as a team, and we stepped into something higher, something bigger, yeah. a higher purpose, a bigger vision, amazing things happen. So. Man, I'm preaching. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going. I'm, I love that. I'm going. I, love that. <laughs> I love that too because Bree got actually got to play for Twyla finally after getting recruited by yeah. her. Sounds like at the mm-hmm. end. So that's pretty cool. That's kind of a fun little amazing story. It's, it's there. amazing. Yeah. Circle. Yeah. So Twy- Twyla is amazing. And I think, yeah, you're so right. Like, what an epic story to have Twyla recruit her. Then Twyla to, like, left to go take yeah. her, you know, do her thing. And to now then for them to reunite and have that share that that championship together was fantastic. So Twad is amazing. Yeah, Bree's amazing. So well, that's really, I mean, and that is what I mean, you said it. That's what it's all about, really. I mean, when you look at that, you go, what is that bigger? What is that? I, I love how you said you replaced the the what with the who. And I and I think that that is so important. And it's also freeing, right? It frees you from that performance, that continual performance has to be perfect like you said yep. always worried about whatever someone seeing you or you know and i know what i have i have five kids i i've seen this with my <laughs> kids they're you know my daughter just the other day was like dad i you know i i'm hurt i or i got too much homework i think is what it was the other day and my wife <laughs> said what's really your problem what's really going on and so yep. she started asking and and pointed to some words on a page my, as I said my wife is a much better mother than well a much better parent than I am because she's definitely a better mother than I am. but um but she goes what, what words and so my, my daughter pointed to fear and and scared and because she's she started practicing with the boys and she's 12 and and so that it, you know brought that out in her because she so. she's got this again desire to perform and wants to be the best and doesn't want to make the mistakes and Again, who are you? What is it about? Is it, it's about you developing as a person, as a human, you developing as a team, as one. You know, what does that look like? And then, yeah, there will be mistakes, but we're going to cover for you. And you, you have that ability, that freedom to fail that comes with that identity, knowing who you are, right? And that's, that's something that I, when you're self-aware, when you know who you are, we talked about self-awareness earlier. We talked about that in a previous episode with Eric Pfeiffer. If you want to go back and listen to that episode, mm-hmm. it's fantastic. But that's something that is so important. And like you said, when you focus on that, who then it frees you up to play at levels you never thought you could play at before. And that's what, you know, with Bree, that sounds like exactly what happened, which is, I love it. Love it. Yeah. So, you know, going back to that recruiting conversation, you know, so you know, recruiting in college soccer, it really, you know, teaches us a lot about recruiting in business world. Lots of lessons yeah, yeah. from that as well. But uh, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? I know we talked about how you, even with recruiting, you're doing it a little different at, at Pepperdine than I can yeah. might read in a book somewhere about college soccer yeah. 101. Yeah. So you can yeah. uh, share about that a little bit and I'm sure we can find some lessons we can learn about that. In, in yeah. Um, I, I mean, to, to kind of keep it aligned, if you will, um, we have a different kind of philosophy if you will on on recruiting because of what we prioritize in our program you know so with this you know developing women of character really and i and i can say this i, I know we're not the only ones to think this way but I, but it it really does align with kind of again our, our vision and our mission which is that you know when you look at who you want right we just said who you want who do you want in a program for us it's always character first, people first, like talent second. You know what I'm saying? Like when we go, we, we, we'll identify some really great players. We're lucky enough that we get some of the best players in the country to come play for us, you know, and, and we're very, very blessed and fortunate for that. But that is not, we're not interested in, in just that, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, so for us, it's, you could be a great player, but if, if you're not a great person, if you don't have a great heart, great character, then, it's just not going to work. You know, it's not going to work. And I remember Tim, I, I was not privileged, but talk about stories, Tim. Um, I remember Tim telling me about one of, one of uh, Pepperdine's all time great captains. And it was before my time, but Tim has mentioned this over and over again. He said he was at a field one day recruiting and he was, um, went to watch this player and they were out in the field and their team lost. Okay. The team lost. And as you know, when you got, you know, you know, you're a, 
super complex and there's like 50 fields, right? You know, it's like just so many people everywhere. And so he's, he's up, going up and down the touchline and I think he stayed to watch part of the next game. And so the team that just played that lost with the player that he went to watch, they went over into the corner, you know, and they're waiting for their coach and they're waiting for the parents and all that sort of stuff. And they're doing the cool down. And so he happened to walk by this team when this, again, they just lost. And I think they, they, it was a semi-final match and they had a chance to make it a championship. I don't think they made it to the championship match. And he said, he walked past. And as he walked past that player that he was looking at, he heard, he heard this player say, come on, ladies. She's like, get your heads up, pick your heads up. He's like, or she said, sorry. She said, pick your heads up. She's like, I know we lost this match, but we've got another game to play for. So we got to, we got to, we got to be, we got to be right. So stay positive. And she's, and she had these like inspiring words. Mm -hmm. He said, he walked past. He said in that moment, he's like, that's going to be my future captain of Pepperdine. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, it had no bearing on like how she just played. Right. In that moment, he's like, that's, that's, that's a player needs to play at Pepperdine because a character was coming out in that moment. And so, um, so for us, you know, it's, you know, we, again, we, we get to see a lot of talent, you know, um, but, but really it's about, really it's about, you know, who you are as a person and where, can you, can you marry that, that, uh, that ability to be a great player, but also be a great teammate. And that, and as when we go out and we're recruiting, that's something that we're very vigilant of and that, and there's different ways in which we evaluate that. But for Tim, that was just a choice moment. It's just, it was indirect. It was just, a, it was just happened to be walking onto the next field. But in that moment, it was, it was a window into that person's heart, a window into that person's mind. And that told Tim in that moment, everything that he needed to know about who she would go on to become. Right. And yeah. that type of woman of character that we were trying to recruit into the program. And so, and so that, that's how we work through some of these things is it's, you know, we start, yes, for sure, with talent. You have to be talented to play at the highest level, but ultimately to sustain to sustain a career and to go on and do the things you want to do, um, character is what, is, what, is what will take you there, you know? Um, and then I think the second thing, if I just, I could talk about a lot of things, but if I, I think that the other thing that I think is important that we, we talk about a lot is when it comes, and this may be for anybody that parents or anybody that's listening to this talk about recruiting, I think we talk a lot about there's a difference between going somewhere they, that you want to be at versus a place that you're meant to be at mm. like so many people like uh, you you get into this i you know i know i know financial reasons right there's going to be scholarships and all these different things there's reasons why you would go to a school right you like the school they're giving you a, a good a good scholarship and so on and so forth but ultimately when you when you look at it when we talk about the scope of like for instance transferring there you see now so many people transferring well why are they transferring because ultimately because so many people are committing so early now it's yeah. like do they really know what they are committing to and who they are committing to and what type of culture they're committing to and there's a lot of amazing schools out there and there's a lot of amazing a lot of opportunities a lot of choices but we actually almost do and it's crazy as it's feel we almost do like a, a reverse recruit most people tell the recruit like everything that they everything about their their program their school that's amazing we tell them all the bad stuff we tell them how hard it's going to be. We tell them how tough it's going to be. We tell them all the reasons why they should. And we're like, if you're, if you're still in love with Pepperdine after you've heard all that, then maybe this is where you're meant to be, you know, but going to a place where you, that gives you fuzzy feelings, like, oh, well, I, I, you know, I want to be there when the going gets tough, you know, what's going to keep you there. You, you see what I'm saying? And Absolutely. it's like yep, I know. knowing, knowing, knowing why, you're, you are where you are is really, really important. And I think that the, the sort of the, the fact that so many people are committing so early, and again, I'm not going to get into like whether I think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but the fact that so many people are committing at such earlier ages, and then you've got the rise in trends. I'm like, well, why is that happening? Because, because when you finally get there and you realize that the team is not what you thought it'd be, or the coaching staff is not who they thought they would be. And again, not, not to speak badly about any coaching staff, um, but it's just, it's just you got to know what you're getting into, yeah. and I think that ultimately, what what we try to do is, is we try to do a lot of that on the front end, and we try and tell them all of the tough stuff, and then we say, look, if you're meant to be at Pepperdine, if you are in love with Pepperdine, or or anywhere, right, UCX or UCY, whatever it's going to be, but when you're when you like feel like you're meant to be there, you're destined to be there, you know you can go there and you can make a difference in that program, and that program's and that school's going to make a difference in you 
that's a different place to come from. Yeah. You don't transfer from a place like that when you're in a place you know where you're meant to be, you know? Yep. And um, and so it's it's a slight it's a slight difference to so that mindset shift. It's a little thing, but I think it makes a big difference. Absolutely. Going to a place you want to be versus a place where you feel like you're meant to be, that you're in love with. And um, by and large, I can say, I, I feel like we've done a pretty good job. Our, our transfer rate is pretty low. And um, and I think that because we, we try and we try and get the right people. We're not looking for the best people. We're looking for the right people, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyways, sorry. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot, but, um, but it's it, recruiting is a, is a, is a huge thing. You know, it's a massive thing. I do. I do. It's a massive thing in every, in every arena. I mean, I remember as an, when I was an attorney and they talked about every, every employee to train them up costs about $150,000 for wow. onboarding yeah. process for a new attorney. So to, that's why retention is so important to really good organizations. Now, not every organization has that kind of ramp up onboarding. Fortunately, my organization would not exist if we had that, but, yeah. um, yeah. but that's the reality now. I don't know where all those numbers come from, but it's a very expensive proposition, right? And, you know, yeah. I transferred, you know, I went to school cause I, I kind of knew in my heart of hearts, it wasn't the right fit, but I wanted to play D one dog on it. So I was going to go to this school and I went and I confirmed my kind of inner, you know, uh, understanding that it wasn't for me and, you know, and that's right. fine. And if that's the case, then, but I would have, it would have been better. I think, uh, mm -hmm. of course I learned all kinds of lessons, all that. Yeah, yeah I know that, but he, right. yeah. so it would have been a very different experience if I would have gone somewhere else. I don't regret a minute of my life, but to that point, I absolutely agree with that, but I want to go back to the, to the character part because it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to say like, we want to go for character but how do you actually see that outside of those moments? Cause you're not going to get that moment with every player that you recruit. So whether it's, yeah. you know, organizations listening in or other college coaches or, you know, and I know there's no yeah. secret. It's not like there's some secret formula, but obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. that's important to you. So you're yeah. looking for it, but you're not always going to see those moments where you see the kid yelling at their mom or you see the kid, you know, giving their mom a big hug after the game. You're just not going to see these things like most of the sure. time. And so how do you get that sure, sure. in an interview? Because if people hear that and know that they want that, they could give the quote right answer and it's hard to know. So you're not <laughs> yeah. perfect, but yeah. how do you suss that out as you're, as you're going through that recruiting process? That's well, it's a great, it's, it's a great, great. Um, I wish I had a, a straightforward answer that, that <laughs> they, they could give you, but it's like, I think part of it is not rushing the process. Right. So I, I can give an example of like somebody, you know, Obviously, I'm not outside. If you saw like the oceans right behind me outside my office, right? A lot, a lot, like um, a lot of people, they come to campus on their visits, and they like they see the ocean, and they see you know Pepperdine, and they see Malibu, and they're like, oh my god, you know, and and they're like, you know, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna commit, you know, and they and we're like, whoa, like we actually tell people like, don't don't do it, don't. Like we actually push people away, and and I'll, and I'll, it will it'll make sense in just a second. We're like, you need to go see other schools. You need to. You need to do that time. And what that also allows us to do is to continue to have conversations with them and continue to talk to them and to continue to watch them and continue to, you know, when they come to campus too, and they come with their parents, like you said, I'm sure there is to some extent there's, you know, they're trying to you know put their best foot forward and stuff, but, but you're not going to be able to just walk out of the field, see somebody two times say, yeah, that's the one like for us we might have a, I might have a relationship with a, with a recruit for a year, you know, or a year, year and a half, like just talking, communicating, getting to know them, asking subtle questions, seeing how they respond to it. And, and over time you get a sense of who they are based on that repetitive kind of situation where you're constantly connecting with them. Um, and then I think something takes over, which is just that intuition, right? They're just intuition. You, you kind of that energy, right? That vibration, you just kind of, you connect with people and you feel certain energies and you're like, she's got it. You know what I'm saying? There's something about her. She's got it. And I, that's the thing that I can't tell you, you know, there's something we'll be as a staff. We're like, you know what? She's, she's got something. But what I can tell you is that we don't get to that intuition. Like she's got it after watching her three times play and then be like, yeah, that's the one. Like it, it, it's more than that. So, so our process of evaluating people is very extensive and when I say extensive, it's not extensive of just, just watching them play. It's having conversations, obviously, when we're allowed to permissible through the NCAA rules. But when, when we can have those fun conversations with them, 
when we can email back and forth, when we can do all of these things and just the, the knowledge that you gain over that time gives us a, almost like a base to then confirm is our intuition correct? You know what I'm saying? And, and so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's those two things, I think, combined. And one thing you can control, you know, the, the questions you ask, the times you go watch and play when they come visit, you know, the one thing you can't necessarily control is that, is that feeling that you get in your heart of like, this person, I feel like she's meant to be here. It goes back to that question, right? Do we, do we want her or do we feel like she's meant to be here? So how we would ask like a, a, a player that, we ask that as a coaching staff too. You know, do we do we just want her or do we do we honestly feel like she's meant to be here? You know, um, and that's that's the part that, that's sometimes tough. And, you know, and uh, but it's an enjoyable part, part too. It's, a, it's an enjoyable process it can be frustrating, too, but it's it's uh, it's awesome. So absolutely. And you probably won't bat a thousand on it. But you know what? If you yep. if, if you have, you know, a good 90 percent that success rate, that's mm -hmm aren't good and i think that's organizations too you know you're not gonna be perfect there will be people that slip through the cracks there will be people that fool you and say the right things and have the right answers whatever but for the most part like you said when you take your time with it when you and extend it out you know you can you can maybe fool them once maybe fool them twice but you know if you have that multiple yep. conversation you're asking the right questions and you're you know like you said if they come with their parents just watch them and yep. and i i want to say out there if parents if you're listening um, actually, you know, anybody listening, whether you're, you're going to be probably interviewing for something at some point. And the reality is people are looking for a lot of different things. And so, um, you know, be yourself because here's the thing, if you, if you, you know, if you're going to be faking it, then it's probably not the fit for you. If you're going to be faking it to try to be somebody else, anybody ever asks me advice on interviewing, I say to them, be yourself, because if you're not yourself, they'll be hiring somebody else and then you'll be miserable. They'll be miserable. <laughs> And so just don't do it. So I, I will say, but I, I love the, I love the focus on that. I think it's why you guys are doing what you're doing. Um, it's why I'm having you on um, <laughs> really be able to share that, that stuff because it's, I know Paul, my, my co-host, I don't know, Baylor, he's, he has a similar philosophy as if you listen to the first yeah. interview I did. Um, and I know he's just going to be geeking out on this interview too, cause he's going <laughs> to, so I know Paul, don't let me oh. talk about it. So anyway, um, <laughs> Before we get in the last couple of questions we always have for everybody, I want to just really quickly give you a chance to talk about what you're doing. You mentioned Life to the Max earlier. Uh, you know, I, I, obviously, people can find out about it. Let, let them know where they can find all the information. Yep. I know you have some different courses people can do. But just give a little uh, you know, blurb on what you guys are doing there because I think it, it relates to you know, the fact that you're doing all that stuff, I know, bleeds into what you're doing and vice versa um uh, at pepperdine so i think it'll tell people more about those different philosophies and you know, the mindset stuff especially that you're talking yeah. about no I, I appreciate the opportunity to share that yeah so i mean that th the whole journey that i shared right back at the beginning you know from red end to to america to georgia to illinois to california like along this time it so much of it has been about kind of understanding why people do what they do and so um so a, a long time ago i knew that there was there was this reach that I wanted to, to have. And so this impact that I wanted to create and, and, and it was important to me. And so soccer is one of the vehicles to do that, but, but it quickly became apparent to me that it's not the only way. And so through the, through the, the development of, of better understanding, you know, why elite athletes, why elite teams, why coaches, why leaders do what they do, I start to formulate a plan to be able to share it with people. And so, you know, it, it really is based off of, off of one question, I would say, like, like if, if I was to boil it down, I'd say that there is literally one question that all of my, you know, my programs, my coaching, everything is built off of it. And it's, this is, you know, what is the difference between good and great? That really is, is it like I've become obsessed and really fascinated with trying to figure out what is the difference between good and great. And it, and it used to be like good and great, like success, but as I've gotten older, it's, it's evolved into what is the difference between good and great in every area of life? just like how I love how you you've kind of married this idea of what soccer can teach us about life and leadership and stuff like that. It's, just, it's the same thing. I'm like, what's the difference between a, a good player and a great player or good results and great results or a good team and great team, good culture and great culture. But what's the difference between a good marriage and a great marriage, a good relationship and a great relationship. What's the difference between being a good husband and a great husband. Like, like there's so, like so many, so many principles that we learn through sports can teach us about life. And so, so a lot of my work is obviously based around 
performance and high performance, but it, but it really then carries over into life, just like with the Bree story, right? You know what I'm saying? She, she learned about how to reach all of her goals in soccer, but she's gone to become this amazing human being. And that, you know, and she, I'm grateful that she attributes part of that to the work we did. And it was mainly her, you know, it was, it was not me. I just kind of like provided a, an opportunity for her to share, share those things. So, so yeah, so, so this life to the max, um, I have a, a number of programs, online programs, coaching courses, group coaching courses that I do like through COVID. I've been, been able to work with, uh, with a lot of coaches, you know, they've not been able to be with their team. So a lot of coaches and leaders have, have, uh, have, have kind of seeked out what I've been doing and we've had these group coaching courses and, and uh and i'm just i I, like you said you said you geek out like i i love this stuff and and i think that uh and i'll give us a little information on how they can can reach it but where i where i started was it was this i used to i started a lot of people would would ask me how can i help them as athletes and that was kind of primarily where it started then it became about teams people that a team would call me up how can you help me as a team but where i've moved into is is this is is I knew for me personally, I was like, you know, as a leader and as a coach, we give so much of ourselves to our team and we give so much of ourselves to our players. And I'm, and I was like feeling this thing about, you know, what's the difference between good or grand? I'm like, who's, who's helping those coaches? Who's, who's helping those coaches better to understand their higher purpose, right? You go back to that triangle, who's helping a coach understand what their vision is and what their personal mission is so they can go back and be an even better leader and an even better, create an even bigger impact for their team. And so, so a lot of my work is now working with other leaders, other high performance leaders and coaches that, so they can actually, so rather than me work with their team, I, I work with the coach and then they go back and they work with, you know, with their teams. And so I'm, I'm really getting into that as well, but also to say, it's really about bringing people together to discover what's possible. And, uh, and I have a website, it's www.maxrook.com. So maxrook, M-A-X, rook, R-O-O-K-E. So www.maxrook.com. You can find out all the information. I've got lots of free resources on there. I've done a few webinars that are free on there. There's some few challenges. Um, you can sign up for my, um, my max moments where I just, you know, send out a bunch of, bunch of videos that I do, uh, lessons and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of free stuff that you can get on there. And obviously a lot of people have, have kind of uh, done some of my, some of my programs, but um, you know, really it's about, about answering that question is how can we help people become their best selves? How can we take them from good to great? And I'm, I'm having so much fun doing it, you know, partnering, partnering what we do at Pepperdine, but also with the life to the max. And it's a, it's a great, it's a great uh, fusion, if you will. No, that's, I, I totally agree with that. I've looked at some of the stuff and I, I haven't been through it. I'd probably be a better person if I had, but you know, um, my kids are keeping me a little busy right now. So I'm not, uh, you know, one, <laughs> one of these days, uh, but I definitely recommend checking it out folks. If you haven't, uh, you know, you, you seen the website, you can go check out the website, get the show notes. You can get the link there. He also gave you the link a few minutes ago. So that's something that we have that uh, is a great, another great resource out there that you guys can use. Uh, we're going to get to a couple other resources here in a few minutes. But before we get there, um, a question I always love, uh, you know, how have you used the lessons you've, you know, we talked about it throughout the thing, but I just want, I'm looking for like lessons on the field that you know, that uh, you've learned directly from the game that you are using in your marriage, um, really other areas outside of the football pitch. Man, um, work, <laughs> work, 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 work. Like when I, when I say work, um, everything takes, takes diligence. I've been married for 13, almost 13 amazing years. And, uh, my beautiful wife is, is one of the most important things in my life. And, and, um, but marriage can be, you know, can, can, can be tough. It takes work. Um, just like winning championships, it takes work. So I think, I think first of all, I'd say that being willing to go deep, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I don't, I've never been a part of a, a team that wasn't willing to go deep to get what they wanted. You know what I'm saying? So going deep, working hard. Um, and then <laughs> as, as cliche as it is, but I'm like being, a, go back to the idea of being part of a team, but like serving, serving, serving at the highest level, you know, like, um, this, the secret to living, right? You know, the secret to living is given. You know, that thing that Tony Robbins was one that said, one that said that he said, the secret to living is given. 
And um, the secret to great teams is giving. The secret to a great relationship and a great marriage is giving. The secret to to anything in life is 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 giving. You know, and um, and so yeah, the beautiful game. Like I love how you say the beautiful game. I love that. Now I'm now I'm, now I'm going, I'm going in a in a perspective now. But I'm like yeah, the beautiful game. Like beautiful things in life. They come when you give you know, and, uh, and that's really go back to day one when I was a little kid, like early on, you learn as a part of a team and part of playing soccer that got to give, got to give, got to give effort, got to be selfless, but giving will lead to amazing things, you know? Um, so I don't know, I'm getting all sentimental, but I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but it got sentimental there, but, but yeah, but, but, but service, but it, yeah, going deep, going deep, being willing to work hard. And then at its core, just, just being willing to serve. Never looking for a particular, there's no wrong answer to that question. I mean, <laughs> no answer is the only wrong answer, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, as you were talking about, you got to give, I, I just, you know, was thinking I'm going to, I'm going to take it down to like, totally, you're going all sentimental about to cry and now I'm going to bring it back so that we can, you know, get the tears out and just say <laughs> all I thought about when you were talking about that. I was talking, first of all, I was thinking all kinds of biblical verses, you know, about Jesus serving, yep. I came yep. to serve, not to be served and, you know, to see the, yep. the servant, you know, to serve, to serve, to serve. I mean, that's all you hear, but what I, all I thought about from soccer is you can't have the go without the give, right? So <laughs> on the, on the wall yeah. pass, right? Yeah. The, I the, love that, the, right? The receiving, but you know, you know, you can't have that forward movement, you know, yeah. without that giving someone is going to yeah. give to yeah. you and you, and, and that's just yeah. those services. You know, we talked about this yeah. just versus the goal and this, <laughs> just as valuable. Well, why you said that, why you said that, Phil, uh, now I'm going to date myself back to the, to the, late nineties when I was playing at Mercer back when I making Georgia, I told you about, yeah. uh, we, had, we had, we had, we had some pretty good teams. And, um, there was a guy that I played that came also came over from England. I didn't know him when it, when I was, when I was in England, but we met when we came over here with two, two English guys that came over at the same time. He was a striker and I was a midfielder and, uh, he would score the goals and I would, I would serve him. I would assist yeah. him. Right. And I, yeah. I have the, I got have the assist record and stuff like that, but we were known as Batman and Robin. He was Batman and I was Robin, you know? Okay. And I'm like, what does Robin do? Robin serves. Robin serves Batman. I was like, so you do this. I'm like, I was Robin. So I guess I was born to serve. So, um, yeah, that was somebody did an article on us one time and they're like, hey, Batman and Robin. And I was like, all right, like, I don't mind being Robin if it means that we, you know, we're successful and we achieve our goals. I have no problem being Robin. So, um, and that's why you're everybody can be Batman. That's why you're teaching yeah. leadership right now. It's because you know yeah. the best the best leaders have followed and know how to follow. Yeah. And so that's something that's super critical to to know and understand. And I love that. And I, I will say Mer, you know, Mercer, it's funny when you said make it, I'm like, oh, he went to Mercer. Forgot about that in fact. Cause I I Paul and I actually my co-host here, um, we have our connection in Atlanta. We were back there right around the same time, early two thousands. But uh, fun, fun little Georgia connection, random, but uh, but kind of cool. So, um, last question: uh, okay, What bro. have you read, watched, or listened to recently that has impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? Uh, great question. Lots and lots. But the I'll bring it back to our team because I feel I feel like you know whatever we're working on as a team right now. I think that uh, that kind of resonates with me. So. So each year we have these different themes, like a lot of teams do. And we read the book Legacy um, by James Kerr, I believe. Um, yep, the book right. Legacy is about, about, the, about the New Zealand All Blacks. Yep. Um, I'm sure, sure a, lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the people listening will have, will have read that. If you haven't, I suggest you do. But it, it really talks about um, the culture of the All Blacks. And it kind of just relates really to that idea that we talked about with having that higher purpose and what their higher, higher purpose is and a program that man like is the winning it i believe something you, you, you probably read it before right so it's like the winningest program has the highest winning percentage in the in all sports combined like take every sport across the entire world this one team has the most successful you know win rate if you will in the history of of, of their their existence and yet what they value is not what you would think you know what they prioritize is not what you would think it goes back to the whole shift of mentality that shift in focus and that shift in mindset and reading that was just a real eye-opener um 
and it, in a lot of ways it was kind of a little bit like we were reading pieces of of what we do at Pepperdine not everything but there were some pieces like oh we do that and and it was really reaffirming to know that we're on the right track but also we, we still have growth um but yeah great book great read the way it's written is fantastic the stories in there are unbelievable the principles are amazing um you can apply it to life you can apply it to business you can apply it to sports any team would benefit from reading that any coach would benefit from reading that um so yeah great book and then obviously the first chapter sweep the sheds it's awesome right yep never be never be too big to do the little things that need to get done so um so yeah that's a great that's a great book yeah i love it we actually you all have to go back and listen to graham roxborough the roxborough the uh head coach actually my daughter's coach up at trinity western we had a, a show he he's the one who introduced me to the book because he was going through it with his yep. team there yep. and we talked yep. about two or three of the chapters during my interview with him so i you know you'll love yep. that love that interview for many reasons yep. but that's, that's a cool thing and then a previous guest you know, i don't know when this is going to air exactly but uh also recommended it so in what 12 episodes now we've are 13 or however yep. many we are at this point when it airs um yep. i've recommended that book so if there's nothing I kind of have a rule in life of three people that I respect recommend a book. I got to read it. And, uh, yeah. and so, you know, spiritual leadership, yeah. one of my favorite books in the world, Oswald Sanders, he said something that's always stuck, mm -hmm. which is choose your books. Like you choose your friends, but, yeah. um, you know, and I'm going to tell you right now, legacy is one that will be worth your time. If you haven't read it already, yeah. a lot of people have, a lot of people know about, yeah. it, but if you haven't check it out, it's an easy read. It's one that I went through with my high school team. Um, so there is some, you know, language here and there. There's some things that you yeah. might have to there is, there is, there is. out if you're working. And an old school one, old school one. Uh, so if you go back to, to now flip it back to mindset, an old school one is Napoleon Hill, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. That is an old school kind of like, you know, businessy one, but, but a great thing on mindset is it's, uh, oldie, but, uh, but a goodie. That's right. So you Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. You already talked about mindset by Carol Dweck too, which is a, a yeah. on mindset. So. But uh, yeah, there's, there's, you know, so much out there I love. And, you know, the one, the one thing I love about this, uh, this question is we are able to get more resources that we can talk about. Some are fun, some are, some are deep, some are serious. You know, I think the great thing about legacy is it mixes a lot of those things. It also is interdisciplinary. And I think the funny thing is the most recommended book in this entire How Soccer Explains Leadership show so far is a rugby book, um, which I think <laughs> speaks a lot to the fact that we can learn from other disciplines, we can learn from other sports, from other things, which is kind of the point of the show, if you haven't caught that already. Um, and so I'm hoping that you're catching on to that. I'm hoping you're thinking that way. I'm hoping you're seeing these different connections. And so, but you know, before I get in, I'm, I'm already starting to like close out the show, but I haven't thanked you yet. So thank you, Max. I very much appreciate oh, um, you being on and, and really what you're doing, all that you're doing at Pepperdine. It's just encouraging me. It's, it's always inspiring to me to see these programs, you know, because I obviously have five kids, four of them are, you know, have those aspirations to play at that next level to see coaches like you doing it um, encourages me. So thank you. Keep it up. No, and thank you for having me. I I'll write back at you. I, I already told you before that uh, you're, you're, you, we all, we all, we are all in process of creating impact and you are, you are impacting lives, brother. So I really appreciate everything that, that you're doing and, and appreciate you having me on. So keep it up yourself. Uh, you're doing great things. Thank you. Well, um, always encouraging. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Very much appreciate it. Very much appreciate what you're doing. Uh, folks, you know, if you have kids that are really, really good soccer players with high character, check out Pepperdine. It's really not a place to visit, bad place to visit anyway. So just have a, a trip out there, informal recruiting trip, even if they don't invite you. Um, check it out. So, um, but, uh, you know, as always, I want to just thank you for taking your time to be a part of this show. Just by listening in, you're a part of this. Um, I've always said to, to people when they get involved with my organization, whether you like it or not, you're part of the family now. So uh, I would like to say the same thing to you. I do consider that. So please connect with us if you have any questions, comments, things you want to share, ways this has impacted you, people you think you want to think would be good on the show. If you're one of those people that you think would be a good fit for the show, send me an email. Uh, Phil at how soccer explains leadership.com. I'll get back to you. And uh, I look forward to hearing those comments. And again, questions, Paul and I will answer those questions on our, on our uh, episodes that we do together too. So if you want to share those questions, but uh, mostly I just, I just hope that you take all that you're learning through this episode, through all the episodes you're listening to, through these different resources we're giving you, I pray that you take these things, you learn from them and you understand them and you help all of these things will come together 
and help you to understand better and better how you can improve your leadership through soccer and through all the lessons you're learning through it. So thanks a lot, folks. Have a great week.